to start out with a little snapshot of where we're at. Um, you know, pretty solid yields here in uh, in CWRS. Uh, Durham is much the same. Uh, and, you know, it's a big Durham area down here. Um, the last five years is basically our top five years in uh, both the spring wheat and Durham production in the province's history. So, uh, as far as bushels go, um, obviously 2016 was a bit of a hit on quality, particularly in Durham, but um, but it, it was a big year for yield. So we've got some pretty high yielding varieties. Richard talked about those a little bit. Jim's going to talk about them a bit more. And we've got some pretty solid agronomy, which uh, I think Chris will get into after, after my talk here. But um, really good quality. I think we've seen this one uh, similar, or at least similar to this. Uh, this is one of the harvest sample program from the Grain Commission. Pretty solid uh, quality there in 2017. Much improved over 2016, where uh, it was a big hit. Uh, and again, this is CWRS. Uh, in 2016, the Durham was uh, was quite dismal, and, and the, the pie chart that here didn't really show the true story because so much would be beyond um, the standard grades uh, into the sample and uh, commercial salvage, but uh, much better in 2017. So, uh, in terms of what contributes to yield, you got your genetics, fertility, you got water, moisture. Um, and, uh, and the solar radiation. But what takes that yield away is what I'm going to focus on here today. Disease, insects, weeds, <coughs> harvest. Um, we're not going to talk too much about harvest or, or heat stress uh, today, focusing really on the disease, insects, and weeds. So start off uh, right off the bat here with the disease part. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about seedling disease before we get into and to the in-season diseases. So infection level, um, you see, likely seen this uh, picture here before. You got heavily damaged fusarium damaged kernels on the left, and moving to the right to a non-damaged kernel. See this non-damaged kernel here on the on the right. Any guesses on what quality of seed that will give you? Good. I'm glad to see there's no guesses, because you don't know. It's spelled out right up top. Percent of fusarium damaged kernels does not indicate anything about fusarium infection. Fusarium infection can, 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 um, can occur much later than, uh, than leads to damage, like in here. So later infection will lead to a pretty sound looking kernel, but from a seed perspective, it doesn't tell you anything. It has to go to the seed lab to find out what the percent uh, infection is on the on that seed and that's just fusarium there's other seedborne diseases as well uh, the other story here uh, certified seed does not mean disease free certified seed uh, is a good product it's deli it delivers what it's supposed to deliver but the uh, disease test is not part of it and so uh, when you're buying seed uh, I certainly encourage you to ask for a disease test and uh, from a seed grower perspective um, doing a single uh, disease screen on a seed lot um, just as a, as a good marketing tool, I think, for them uh, to show where they're at. And they will tend to have uh, pretty good seed. Most seed growers are really good and that they, um, they've got their own individual thresholds for what they will sell in terms of disease seed. Um, and if it has some disease on it, it doesn't mean you should shy away from it. You just need to know what you've got. So disease testing will determine the this level of seedborne pathogens, and it'll show up on the test as a percent infection. So that um, disease could be from surface contamination, or it could be from internal colonization of the seed, where it, uh, that is coming actually from inside uh, the seed. So that infection, um, it'll, in, from a fusarium perspective, It'll number the seeds tested that is infected with fusarium species, and that'll div divide it out uh, specifically fusarium graminearum and also total fusarium species. Um, some, some implications of differences, um, but for most of the area here, probably more worried about the total fusarium. That doesn't take into account any soil borne disease, and that can be influenced by your field history, because um, we talked about fusarium a lot last year after 2016, and people were asking about um, fusarium um, 
from pulses because fusion air can infect pulse roots and so you're seeding that uh, your cereals into a pulse uh, residue and uh, so there may be a, a soil or a residue borne disease uh, coming from other than a seed. So they asked the question, is the seed treatment needed? And so we've got a flow chart that we use in, in Saskade. Um, start out first asking the question, is Fusarium gramineri established in your area? And so the total Fusarium species, um, so assuming that it is, is uh, established, then you're looking at total Fusarium species and the percent infection on the seed test results. And generally, um, it's good to go for a, for a seed. Um, if it's less than 10%, you're probably okay to just go ahead and use that seed. And if it's more than 10%, you probably uh, want to, uh, could benefit from a seed uh, treatment. This is only looking at fusarium. There are, like I said, other seed-borne diseases that may uh, affect your decision whether or not to use a seed treatment. There's also the soil-borne uh, diseases. Now, if you're in an area that has not been affected by uh, Fusarium gramineurum, then you can look at this side of the flow chart. But I'm going to argue that most of Saskatchewan has seen Fusarium gramineurum, and you consider it established, and you're only going to look at this side of the flow chart. So this is a snapshot of a seed quality. It doesn't show all of the um, crop districts. Uh, we're, we're in this range down in here. Um, in the, in the southeast corner here, and although there's variation across the province, generally seed quality from a fusarium perspective, at least uh, last year, was pretty good. Uh, this column here is uh, for seed, seed lots tested for fusarium gramineurum. In this uh, southern uh, area, anywhere from 92 to 100 percent of the seed samples that came in uh, were completely free of gramineurum in 2017. For total fusarium, that uh, number drops. So there was fusarium out there. It wasn't graminearum. Um, and so from a seed perspective, there was uh, more of the samples came in um, where only 60 to 75% uh, were completely free of, of disease. But you look at the average infection, it's pretty low. Um, and that in and of itself, probably not going to trigger the need for a seed treatment. But um, there is... Uh, I think some uh, some other things to look at in terms of determining a seed treatment. So, just in general, looking at seed treatments, it does help ensure that the crop does get off to a good start. And uh, getting that crop off to a good start is really important in maximizing the effectiveness of the genetics and the fertility uh, that you apply, and making sure that when your crop is growing, you've got a good, um, good, healthy plant that is producing a. a a photosynthetic engine that's going to drive your yield. And so, if you do happen to be going on a poor quality seed lot, uh, treatment can help it along, but it's not going to cure that seed lot. And I would uh, exercise caution if you ever see a, a seed test come back uh, where it's comparing um, uh, a non treated to a treated uh, sample. That treated sample, from what you see in a lab, can be misleading because it may only be suppressing uh, the d disease symptoms and, uh, and it may, uh, may not uh, last long enough in the field um, to be completely effective. Particularly if you ever see a germination difference in those, um, there, there may be an indication that there's a uh, disease that's um, right inside the seed and uh, that's when it's inside the seed like that, uh, the seed treatment can cause uh, some improvements, but it's not going to lead to a full, healthy, robust plant in the field. So we left 2017 uh, pretty dry. I don't know if that quite, uh, quite drives the point home how dry it was. But um, so you might ask the question, well, why would you treat seed in a dry year? Well, I'm going to ask a question to the audience, see if I can get a response. Anybody go south for the winter? You went south? How hot was it? 32. 32, yeah. You like it down there at 32? For a little while. For a little while, yeah. See, 
Uh, above 25, I melt. <laughs> I've got red hair, that's just the way it works. Um, well, the species that are infecting your seed, they've got that range uh, of tolerances too. Some of them like it uh, warmer, some like colder, and, uh, and even within that, they have a range with which they operate. And so you, 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 you like it uh, down south in the winter at 32, I'm perfectly happy here at minus 5, minus 10. Um, and so the, the species that are going to infect the seed, um, they can be operating fairly effectively even in dry conditions. And so that's your, your Fusarium species, your Azoctonia, and in cold conditions, and the uh, Cochleobulus, that's really a mouthful, Cochleobulus uh, sativus, um, that's uh, another uh, pathogen that it certainly has an effect at uh, dry conditions. And they will operate as well as in conditions get more moist, but uh, generally uh, you get into wetter conditions, then you're looking at uh, a different range of species. So uh, when you're picking that seed treatment, um, our guide for crop protection that the ministry produces is certainly a good guide uh, to give you a sense of the array of products that are available. Uh, you can choose between a systemic and contact uh, type of fungicide, whether it's a single or dual action, um, targeting and fungicides and in, or, uh, fungus and uh, insects. And uh, then when you're dealing with that seed treatment, uh, making sure that the coverage is uniform. It used to be that um, with some of the products that were available, if you had a drop of red on a seed, that was effective. The products we have now, they're much safer to use, but they require uniform, complete coverage. And so in order to achieve that, it really starts with uh, calibration of uh, the seed flow and the flow of the treater into the seed and having dual stage mixing. So uh, uh, there's pretty fancy equipment out there that can do that, but there's also relatively simple ones. But the, the treater on the loader isn't going to be effective enough. It's got to be uh, mixing going in uh, to the auger, and then the auger can provide a, a secondary mixing. So a touch on uh, cereal leaf diseases. Now we're in the season. Uh, leaf spot complex comes from uh, generally three major pathogens, uh, tan spot, Centauria and spot blotch. Uh, they, these images here show uh, some of the differences you might see between them. The spot blotch, that one starts out just small brown specks and that'll move into um, some darker uh, flecks in the leaf later on. That's uh, that Cochleobulus sativus and, um, and it can also lead to a smudge in the, in the head. Uh, Centauria um, that is more irregular uh, spots on the leaf, and then the tan spot, um, kind of the, the elongate uh, tan spots, and you see the yellow halo around them can have that uh, chlorotic effect on, on the, in some uh, varieties. So these are um, polycyclic diseases, and they, uh, they have an overwintering stage, and that will provide inoculum to infect the plant, and then that uh, continues to generate inoculum and reinfect further on. So that means they can grow at a very fast rate and have multiple stages. And so um, in terms of management of a, a disease like that, um, looking for host plant resistance is ideal. And in terms of those leaf spot diseases, um, not as uh, strong of uh, resistance as we, we'd like to see in those. So that, needs to scouting and a fungicide application. And really, like I said before, you're trying to protect uh, and make sure you have a good, strong photosynthetic engine to drive your yield. So you're protecting your flag and uh, the, the penultimate flag, uh, flag leaf, so the one just before the flag. And of course, uh, rotation can be beneficial um, in, in that, uh, to reduce the non inoculum. Other polycyclic uh, diseases in, in, in that um, mm. uh, the, the rust in that they can continually reinfect because they come in on uh, the Pacina pathway. Um, <coughs> we've got uh, stripe rust, which is a short cycle, and the long cycle rusts are leaf and, and, and stem rust. Those ones have uh, largely been managed um, <coughs> through alternate 
we've got really good uh, resistance in the in the varieties we have available, but also. Um, I don't have an image up here, but there was a big eradication effort um, to el eliminate common barberry, which is an alternate host for it. And so eliminating that alternate host made a big difference in the amount of infection of those, uh, those types of rust. But as Richard was saying earlier, the stripe rust has been a problem. Um, and so what happens is that for us, it overwinters in the states where they have more milder weather and uh, good big uh, airflow vectors moving those rust spores up into uh, our growing region. Um, there's sort of some suspicion last year in a few locations where stripe rust was overwintering um, because we had milder winters the last couple of years um, that, that maybe there, there was some overwintering happening. but. Not, didn't really see much uh, for major outbreaks in strike rust last year. Um, so it can be pretty, uh, pretty devastating. Um, it can lead to defoliation and, and shrunken seeds, and it clearly identified strike rust alternate name would be a yellow rust. So uh, we do have uh, resistance in varieties for strike rust, um, and a foliar fungicide application can can help with that, but um, making sure that that uh, fungicide application is, is necessary because there is a plant resistance in them, so knowing whether or not you have a resistant plant will help you determine whether or not uh, that crop may grow, outgrow the infection, and determining the time of infection is important too, whether or not it's going to impact your yield. So a uh, note from uh, Tom Fetch, uh, who's a pathologist with Ag Canada, out of, uh, out of uh, Manitoba. He did a survey this past fall in uh, Manitoba and eastern Saskatchewan. He found strike rust was quite abundant, almost 100% uh, incidence, and was quite heavy in patches uh, uh, that he found on his tour. And so he thought that it might be a potential inoculum for a winter wheat that was overwintering. Um, you know, I, and I, I'm hopeful, I guess, we had a number of long cold snaps here this winter that uh, that will have diminished the amount of overwintering that we might expect from stripe rust because like I said, it does not typically survive our winters here. Um, and the, the other thing is uh, we were relatively low snow cover uh, for most of those cold snaps. <coughs> so moving on, uh, Fusarium hip blight. Uh, Fusarium hip blight was heavily covered last year in a number of presentations, uh, so I'm not going to get really deep into it, but uh, hard to dismiss uh, something as devastating as it can be. Um, so it's really favored by the moist, warm conditions at flowering time. And so Sasquatch uh, has, has led the charge on having some, um, some Fusarium headlight risk maps here in Saskatchewan, and those are a really good tool, but they have to be used in conjunction with the flowering timing of your crop and so it's going when your crop is flowering going into their website uh, on a regular if, if not daily basis to go and check and see what the map is showing for risk and that will be based on weather station data collected by wind uh, weather innovation network and uh, applied to a, a, a model to indicate what the risk level might be for a spring or winter wheat in terms of uh, managing for fusarium head blight, um, starting with a host crop, um, ideally rotating so you're uh, growing cereals no more frequent than every other year, ideally a two year gap in between where you're con particularly concerned about fusarium head blight. Um, but if it has to be that every other year, then you're ideally rotating some of the uh, wheats with some of the oats and barleys that are more um, more resistant to fusarium hip blight and they're uh, decreasing the amount of inoculum buildup uh, from the cereal uh, in your rotation. And the reason for that gap between cereals is just to allow time for that uh, uh, strong residue to break down and, uh, and uh, decrease the inoculum level because the inoculum does survive on, on the residue. Then use the risk maps that I showed in the last slide in associated with uh, fungicide application. Uh, those are the big ones. Um, stubble management and harvest handling. Those are other management practices you can implement. 
but they're not going to be as big of impact as, uh, as these ones. So unlike those other ones where you can have continual reinfection, um, Fusarium hip blight is a monocyclic disease and you can't wait till you see it to manage for it. It has to be managed before uh, infection occurs. Once the symptoms are there, it's too late. Moving on out of diseases into insects. Uh, so wheat midge, um, the risk map for 2018 is on our website and uh, everything basically is in that uh, in that low risk range. And part of the reason for that was the dry conditions we had last year. In order for um, midge to be successful in a year, they require uh, 25 millimeters of rain by the end of May. Richard said they only had two inches all year uh, during the growing season, so certainly not going to be any in the swift current area. Um, but uh, that uh, rainfall, if they don't have that by the end of May, their emergence becomes delayed and it's much more erratic. And so the likelihood of them uh, emerging at a time when they're going to be able to affect the, the wheat to match up with the timing where the wheat is susceptible is much uh, diminished. So in terms of, uh, of management for it, assuming a conventional uh, non-SM1 wheat, um, so that requires you out in the field, uh, monitoring when the crop is in the susceptible stage. And so when that head becomes visible, so just as it's starting to sh come out of the boot, um, until flowering is your susceptible period. So you're out in the field, often down at canopy level in the evening when the winds are lower, uh, scouting for the midge. And so that's a fair bit of work. Um, and so what uh, some, a lot of people have opted for is to grow with the midge tolerant varieties. Um, and so in the conventional wheat, um, the susceptibility drops when, the, when flowering occurs and, and thesis and that is a result of natural um, buildup of ferulic acid in the head, and the midge doesn't like that. So, um, the midge tolerant wheat is, um, <coughs> offers protection against uh, wheat midge. It's based on the gene SM1. And last year, uh, similar to at least the last three, maybe longer years, um, midge tolerant wheat was grown on about a third of acres in Saskatchewan. Uh, so there's been an incredible uptake of those varieties. This is just uh, going into the eighth growing season for midge tolerant wheat uh, in Western Canada. And so it's been pretty impressive both uh, from a breeder's perspective and uh, from producers in their uptake of those varieties. And so there's options available in all of these classes, uh, Canada Western Red Spring, uh, CPS Red, uh, Soft White, Special Purpose, uh, Extra Strong if anybody still grows that, and, uh, and Durham. Um, and so a decision that producers have had to make uh, over the last few years, particularly the earliest years of uh, the midge tolerant wheats, was they're selecting either for midge tolerance or fusarium tolerance. You don't have to make that choice anymore. Uh, there's you know, Richard alluded to some uh, up and coming lines that are uh, in the breeding program. There's also some uh, you'll see in the SAS seed guide that uh, have uh, pretty good um, fusarium hip blight tolerance um, and, uh, and are also midge tolerant wheats. So check it out in the seed guide or at the midge tolerant wheat.ca. But uh, I guess a, a request that I would make um, last year, um, it was discovered that a number of soft white spring and special purpose wheats are, were actually midge tolerant, and they were uh, along the way in the in the pipeline of being uh, delivered to producers, um, and so most of them were still in the pedigreed seed stage. They're able to catch them in time uh, to add a refuge. A refuge is really important, and because it's a single gene resistance, and uh, just like you heard about earlier, uh, talking about uh, um, buildup of uh, resistance to antibiotics in. in in the bacteria that uh, affect humans, well, midge uh, can, can build up a resistance to the SM1, and so it's managed with a refuge that's susceptible, and so the, the way the, the, the odds work out, um, the probabilities are that the, susceptible, or the ref, uh, resistant midge will meet with a susceptible midge, 
and uh, the, the population remains susceptible uh, to the, the midge tolerant wheat. Uh, and so that's what we want, is the midge that are affected by midge tolerant wheat. Uh, we don't want the resistance that's in the wheat to be overcome by the, the shift in population of the midge. Uh, briefly, and, yeah. how, how does the midge tolerant wheat uh, work? I, I don't know if everybody explained it. Uh, so it, the, the SM1 uh, gene, it affects the, uh, the midge when they, when they bite in, it basically uh, uh, kills them. Uh, so yeah, really strong deterrence. <laughs> And I don't know, Richard, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it's a, a naturally higher level of ferulic acid in it, isn't it? Yeah, I was just going to say that it's, and it's gone when the grain mature. Yeah. 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 So it's a pretty deep, pretty deep thing. Yeah. So um, there was two of those varieties, though, uh, Chiffon and Sadash, that were uh, released prior to them being found to be midge tolerant. And I know it's not really a big... Um, big uh, soft white or feed wheat area here, but uh, if, if, any, if any of you do happen to have those, uh, I encourage you to contact a seed grower and either get the refuge built back into those or buy new seed as needed because uh, the benefits that occur from uh, wheat midge are pretty broad. Um, a lot of producers are using them and uh, that, that uh, tolerance could break down pretty quickly if those pure stands of those that uh, remain, uh, remain out there. Um, in the short term, if you can't get that uh, rectified, uh, spraying for midge would also be effective to kill off uh, ones that are um, that are, are resistant to make sure they're not multiplied. So grasshoppers, uh, that we've had grasshopper maps for years now that uh, show a risk up in the, that Meadow Lake region, but uh, not much else anywhere in the province. But um, Long, long dry falls um, do, uh, do favor grasshoppers. Um, now it didn't, uh, didn't show up on our map here this year to, to be a favorable to them despite a uh, long dry fall last year. So uh, that's good news, but certainly something to keep an eye out for if we do remain dry. Um, for pest species, we do have quite a number of grasshoppers in the province. And what you're looking for under the throat there's a little spur, kind of like an Adam's apple, I suppose, um, that uh, is on the, the pest species. And for the non-pest uh, species, you know, if you've got those knobs on the antenna, if it's an adult early in the season, uh, red, orange, yellow wings, um, if, they're, if they're making a lot of noise if it's while they're sitting, or if they crackle when they fly, uh, basically not a pest species. Cutworms, we have seen a bit more of those uh, in recent years. Um, and so, nice part about them, uh, you can manage with the insect, foliar insecticides. Downside is, because they spend a fair bit of time underground, um, it can take some time uh, to get the control that you need, because they, uh, they don't all come to the surface to feed each night. Aphids, we've seen a number of them over the past few years, less in 2017 than, than we did in 2015 and 16. Um, they, they like the moisture conditions in those years. Um, and they, the population of them can really uh, balloon really quickly because they can give birth to, to live young. Uh, so they, they don't have to go through all the, the same uh, stages and they, they, they can I guess the population can just go out of control very, very, very quickly. And the uh, nice part about these is there are a lot of uh, natural pests for them. Um, the, the ladybird beetle, um, it's like a, a ladybug, the, the larval stage, does uh, quite enjoy aphids. Um, and so, you know, when you're out scouting for aphids, watching for, uh, for some of those species that uh, can parasitize them makes quite a difference too. I wanted to touch on wheat stem sawfly, uh, not because I think it's a risk for 2018, but um, I know a lot of growers have had questions over the past few years, um, because Lillian is one of those varieties that's moving out of the CWRS class into the Canada Northern Hard Red. This is the year that that'll take impact, and so anybody growing Lillian, 
if you want to stick with the CWRS class, uh, you'll need to change uh, change varieties this spring because it won't be marketed as CWRS in the fall. It's not to say it won't be marketed. It'll be marketed as Canada Northern Hard Red. Now the question is, I don't know how many elevators are going to be offering bids on uh, CNHR, and I don't know what uh, what the price difference between a CNHR and a CWRS price point will be. I expect it's probably going to be a little bit less. But Lillian uh, was uh, quite remarkable in that it was uh, it was quite good for uh, tolerance to the wheat stem sawfly because it was a, s a solid stem. There are a number of other varieties that have been introduced into the CWRS class. They're not quite where Lillian was, but um, they're certainly considered a semi-solid stem. Uh, CDC Adamant, which is a mixed tolerant, CDC Hughes, and CDC Landmark, again, all three of them are also uh, midge tolerant uh, varieties with a semi-solid stem. And if you get to a point where you're really concerned about uh, midge, Richard <coughs> mentioned this one, AAC Concord, uh, is, yeah, it surpasses a million from a stem solidness perspective. Um, and of course, we're down here in Durham country. Uh, there's a couple of uh, Durham varieties that are also uh, solid stems, uh, varieties that can be a uh, used, but um, Durham in and of itself has a heavier pith expression than CWRS wheat uh, already. Uh, I mentioned cereal leaf beetle, again not because I consider it a major threat, but um, it was found in southwest Saskatchewan in 2008, uh, and it was some found again in 2015, both in southwest and southeastern Saskatchewan. Um, that's a picture of it to get an in indication of what it looks like. Uh, and what you're looking for is that feeding between the leaf veins. Um, it is a good candidate for biocontrol, but really very few observations of this pest. Uh, we just don't want it to, uh, to get to a stage where we have an outbreak. So if you're watching for it, then we'll get a better indication than working with uh, with the entomologist here at Saskig, um, be able to access some of the biocontrol options. Uh, about how big are those? You know, that's a good question. I'm not sure on the size of it. I have to get back here and check, check in with, uh, with Jim. Now, touching briefly on weeds, uh, less so on weeds <coughs> and some of the risks from that will occur this year from uh, weed management. And this relates primarily to the lack of rainfall that we had last year and the dry conditions we had going into the fall. They're very, very dry, and particularly in this area. You guys know that very well. Um, sorry, I borrowed this slide from our, our weed specialist and I didn't realize it had the animations in it. Um, so this is a herbicide half-life and for anything that has residual effect, um, you know, this is the level here for weed efficacy to get to the control of the weed. But by the time you're replanting uh, something that's susceptible to that herbicide, you need the level of that herbicide to drop down and to a, safe, a level that's safe for recropping. And if you follow this curve here, if you have ex excessively dry conditions, then it can uh, delay the um, the recropping restrictions beyond what normal conditions might be of the 12-month period, right? And so, if your if your product that you used last year uh, is if it was indicated that it had a recropping restriction of of, of one year, um, the dry conditions may cause that to move even further out. And so, with a cereal like wheat, um, looking at the the risks for that, uh, looking in particular at the soil actives like uh, edge trif uh, trifluralin, um, and uh, taking a peek at the maps here to show where the risk of uh, carryover occurs, um, and we're certainly in, in that zone uh, in this area where there's pretty high risk of some of those kind of herbicides uh, carrying over. It's not to say that absolutely that it will, but it, the risk is there. And so you want to make sure that they allow proper time for the, uh, any recropping restrictions that are, are there. And so 
to get an idea, um, this is pulled out of this year's Guide to Crop Protection, so at page 77, 78, um, give you an idea of the recropping restrictions and the uh, chemistries that may apply. So I uh, encourage you to go there. Um, those uh, guides uh, should be in Saskatoon office. Jerry? They came this morning. Perfect. <laughs> it's also been available on our website for uh, about a week or so. So, you know, we're, like I said, we're right in that zone uh, for uh, looking at carryover. And uh, lots of areas of the province are at moderate risk. And some of the, the new products that are out there that have uh, soil activity, um, you know, they go through a fairly long, extensive testing period. We also have a pretty long, extensive uh, winter than normal period. And so not as much experience with uh, dry conditions uh, in, in some of those chemistries. And so, uh, you know, what's, what you're looking for in uh, in uh, persistence uh, is, is really moisture uh, for both the microbes and, and chemistry to start to break down uh, those, those uh, herbicides. So uh, yeah, check your check your labels on those. So uh, basic uh, summary, uh, you know, if your agronomy is good, uh, it's a good start for pest management. Uh, and rotation is a, one of the best starts you can give uh, to your pest management program. Variety selection is really important. Uh, Richard talked about it earlier. Jim will talk about it again. Uh, and Chris will be talking about uh, some of the agronomic options right after me here. Uh, knowing the pests uh, that you're looking for and the life cycle. Is, uh, you're dealing with and whether or not uh, that uh, pest in particular is going to balloon out of control or if there's, uh, if there's uh, things that will keep it in check such as uh, uh, predators to that pest and uh, making sure to plan for the conditions you have. It's uh, different uh, different than we were a year ago. You're going off really excellent soil moisture conditions um, following fall 2016 and a lot of disease in the seed. So we've got pretty good seed and uh, pretty dry conditions except uh, I'm hoping that we got uh, a good, good lot of moisture in that snow and that keeps us uh, ground covered here for a good while yet to get some moisture in the ground that keeps seeding on the road uh, with, a, with good, a good start to it. So a uh, couple resources um, to watch for some of those pests that do come out. I encourage you to, to sign up for a prairie, prairie pest monitoring uh, blog. You can just uh, Google prairie pest monitoring. You'll find it. Um, our own website was uh, reorganized earlier this year. Uh, it's uh, a lot more efficient uh, in terms of finding what you're looking for. And, uh, and of course, the federal government has some pretty good uh, publications as well.